some bottles on the bottom row. Yeah. I'm uh, sure you lots, win. Lots of magic. We'll we'll look at it all one day. Oh, we're live. Look at that. Congratulations. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Adam Grace. Welcome to Afternoon Astonishment from Conjurer Community, the world's best magic club. I'm here with uh, Steve Barcelona, Alexander Slimmer, and uh, Aaron Fisher has the day off today. So today we are going to be looking at something very special. Let me introduce Alex. Alex, you can tell them what we're going to be watching today. What is it? We're going to continue uh, our look at Barry Richardson. And Barry Richardson is a, a mentalist that has some really groundbreaking uh, methods. You know, when his books came out, they definitely made a big splash. A lot of people, you know, were really influenced by the stuff. And eventually we saw footage of Barry and uh, that's what we're looking at today is the footage of, of that material that really sort of took the mentalism and magic world by storm. And uh, it's really, really wonderful stuff. Uh, some of the stuff does get uh, a little verbose because I think that Barry is as much like a, a motivational speaker as he is a mentalist or magician, you know. So I think he's trying to wrap good messages into his stuff. So one of the problems with it, if there is a problem, is that some of these pieces are really long. You know, because he, it takes a while to get to the effect because he has a message he's wrapped into these things. So it's not as easy for us to look at it in this format here. But I highly recommend you look at it because, you know, these effects are amazing. Uh, we have been able to cut up some of the effects, edit out some of these effects and look at things that are sort of shorter pieces so that we can digest and have discussion about them. As that's, you know, sort of the point of the show is that we can actually look at the stuff and, you know, jam on magic ideas, as it were. Uh, but great stuff. And we're going to start today with this piece that's um, really sort of a, a way to warm up the crowd and just sort of get to know the audience. They get to know your personality. And this is a good personality piece for Barry. And it's just seemed like a good way to start off uh, Afternoon Astonishment today. So let's, uh, let's, ch let's check this out. This is called Impossible Knot. Oh, you're so sophisticated. Let me ask you a question, my friends. And here's the question. <laughs> is it possible to tie a knot in a rope? without letting go of the ends? Yes. Oh. I heard no. And of course, the answer is no. But the world's filled with people that say no to all sorts of things. Like, no, you can't start that business. Or no, a woman can't really be an engineer. Or no, the, the course is too hard. No one says that. Is it possible, my friends, to tie a knot in a rope without letting go of the ends? Do you see what you've just seen? Do you know if we went to MIT, to the math department, found the brightest people that study space, the mathematics of space, topology, and you ask, is it possible to tie a knot in a rope without letting go of the ends? They would say, no. And what do you say? What did that man do? Give him a round of applause. <laughs> but you're all so clever. You're all so clever. You think this man somehow, because your brain tells you it is not possible, right, to tie a knot in a rope without letting go of the ends. There must be some chicanery. There must be some trickery. So you tie this guy up and tell him to do it slowly as if it were on television. So slowly I could go back and look and see what's happening. Is it possible to tie a knot in a rope without letting go of the ends? Watch how slowly he goes. And my helpful little assistant in your left hand pulled one off and one off over here ever so carefully. Ladies and gentlemen, give her a round of applause. Now, now a minute ago, we said it's not possible to tie a, a, a knot in a rope without letting go of the, uh, the ends. But when I was a student in Minnesota, Ethan. there was a woman who um, took a yellow dye and put it into something which we now call margarine, and invented what we call margarine. That was not possible. In 1949, again, a woman, after the war, invented the idea of taking hotels out of the city center. That's what a hotel meant. And turning it on, her, on the side, what do we call that? A motel. And they said, oh, you can't do that. In fact, sitting here, we said no too early. It's like my mother, who was a Russian immigrant, who uh, was afraid of water, learned to swim when she's uh, 58, 
and swam across Lake Geneva two miles when she's 62. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can do it. All right. But in fact, everyone sitting here in this room could tie a knot without letting go of the ends. Watch. Everyone here could do that. There's a knot. Oh, you cheated, right? You did. And when the woman did the motel, she cheated. When she turned that large to the margin, she cheated. We always say they cheated. And oh, how about the girl coming? So watch this. I'm holding both ends. I tied a knot without letting go of the ends. <laughs> and you say, oh, isn't that something? And we ask again as we go and we say, my friends, is it possible, is it possible to tie a knot in a rope without letting go of the ends? All right, and now we raise the bar. And now we raise the bar. A demonstration you may go home and tell your grandchildren. And the question we're asking is this, is this. Is it possible, is it possible to untie a knot without letting go of the answer? You watch my right hand, you watch my left hand. Watch them slowly. Is it possible? Watch, 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 watch. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> Yo, wow. That's pretty cool. So that's, uh, is it, I, I never say it right. Is it Celephalo knot? I don't know. What's that? That's what it is. <laughs> What's that's that? That's where, where you tie it. I used to know how to do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar with this. I'd never seen yeah. this before. I mean, that's, that is a great thing. And, and the way he's put it to use like that. Right, he made he yeah. got a lot out of just that one because it's really central. It. That's central to the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Twisting and doing that thing, yeah. It's it's become a whole showpiece, and like I said at the beginning, like a personality piece. Like after you watch that, you're like, all right, I think I understand who this guy is. He's just a good-hearted guy that's trying to show me something very interesting, yeah. you know, tickle my mind. And yeah, lovely, lovely With piece. Things like that are worth their weight in gold. I mean, it's just a piece of rope in your pocket, you know. Right. It's right. Once you That's know the thing, you know. Right. It's the it's, epitome of the pack small plays big, right? I mean, it's worth its weight in gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm curious, is is that is that rope stuff uh in, in Barry Richardson's book? Uh oh, do you know? Sure. I think it's in uh yes, I don't know. I don't have Barry Richardson's book, but I think it's in Henry Hay. Oh, it is. I think okay. it is. Let me look real quick. Yeah, look it up. We don't have to wait for me. Well, it's just weird because, yeah, okay. you know, you, you you get so used to seeing all the Tabari stuff, like all those like mm -hmm. classic stuff, but that some of that not tying stuff, like there's a couple of them I know, but some of that I had not seen before, right? Or maybe I had, but it had been a long time. I mean, how many people are you seeing do that material, Alex? Do you see that rope material done a lot? No, these days when you see people do rope material, they're doing Professor's Nightmare. Or they're going hardcore and they're doing Tabari is my experience when I see people right. do it. You know? Same here. Yep. 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 Exactly. Or if you're lucky, rainbow ropes. Yeah. Oh, I remember yeah. those. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Into that. Well, I can't find it right now. Children's performers are obviously using those rainbow ropes because that's easy for a child to understand blinking and unlinking when you can see the colors. It's pretty great. It's a pretty, pretty great piece. I don't know. I've, I, I had sort of a love hate relationship with ro uh, rope magic when I first started magic. Like I, I couldn't understand why a person would carry around a piece of rope and say, I'm going to do magic with it. You know, when I first started doing magic, it was like, it didn't compute. And then one day I went, I, I had a friend, I have a friend that at one point he had a sailboat and he was learning how to sail. And his buddy who was a really experienced sailor came out and was showing us literally the ropes. Right. <laughs> Like teaching us how to pull the ropes how to get the sail up and how to do the stuff on a, a not a huge lake but not a small lake and had a wonderful day sailing and this guy through the course of the day came up that i i did magic and he's like really i do magic i was teaching sailing and i would teach people how to do rope tricks and i would teach them how to do their knots and then we would talk about magic tricks and you know i had a little magic course i was selling on the side and it was only rope tricks because he was a sailor right right well, it blew my mind. I was like, wow, that's that what cool. that's your this is perfect. That this is, is perfect. so great. <laughs> it blew my mind. That is and so great. That, I found room in my mind to be able to see rope magic and be able to think about it and try to interweave it and 
having that story helps, you know, if I ever feel like I'm uncomfortable because it's like a natural lead in right into right, like, Hey, I have a piece of rope. <laughs> I'm, cu I'm curious, uh, all you guys watching, all you guys in chat, like who was your first exposure to rope magic? Just so if you're watching this on YouTube or whatever, you can, you can chat right in the, in the chat there and let us know. I'm curious, like, where was the, where were you, who did you first see do rope magic? Uh, so Lou says it was Daryl. A lot of people say it was Daryl. Look at that. Everybody's mm -hmm. saying Daryl, 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 Daryl. Yes, he was big. I mean, he had, he really, I think he really, uh, brought, brought a renaissance of rope magic. For me, it was, uh, it was someone, it was some rando person doing a Tabari routine that blew me away. I couldn't understand it, not one bit of what was happening. And I was familiar with uh professor's nightmare you know that was about it so i was, I was gonna, but, yeah dan harlan uh yeah dan harlan that's right he he had a couple of great uh rope things um yeah he did i remember seeing him at an ibm convention and he was outstanding with a piece of rope it was Do you know was like three people involved it was beautiful i kind of felt like uh alex does about ropes i kind of was like you know it's kind of like such a cliched thing but then I got exposed to the Sands stuff, George Sands stuff, yeah. because his son, I can't remember his first name, but his son comes around and kind of lectures that stuff a little bit. And I kind of watched it. I was like, hey, that's, I could see that, you know? It was like one of those things where it's like, yeah, I can see that. So that's what kind of got me interested in at least having a couple of different things, you know? Was yeah. work really expensive, like back, like so in the 1800s or the 1700s when when magicians were really formulating a lot of uh, ideas on some of the stage rope magic was rope really an expensive or luxury item back then or was it a pretty common everyday item yeah i don't know, I don't know about back that far i know that one of the like the big move that uh there's a big move that gets credited to slidini a lot in rope magic for a cut and restored rope and it's really uh, Edward Victor's move, which I think puts it around like early 1900s when we're moving into the modern, if we can call it modern rope routine. You know what I mean? So it's probably around that time. And I would guess that there's a lot, at least a lot of twine around. Shipping's happening. We're in the Industrial Revolution. So there's probably some rope-like material around that can be used and cut up and not have to be so concerned where you're like, ooh, I cut off too much that time. I don't know if I have enough for the rest of the week of shows or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I tell you, for a long time, I did a cut and restored. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would just end up with hanks of useless rope, like just pounds. Because exactly. totally. you have the piece that's now you've done the cut and restores. Now it's too short to do anything, but you that's don't want right. to throw it away. <laughs> you know, so it's, I used to have a hook back there. just like full of them, you know, hanging down. It's a dilemma because I, like I said, I have embraced rope magic since then. And now I buy it in big spools and I have a lot of rope that I throw away when I do rope tricks. But, <laughs> my friend came over and goes why do you have all that rope on the wall i'm like well you know i can't use it anymore too so i was like why are you keeping it and i was like yeah why am i keeping it and I threw it away <laughs> hey i like it. i like the word hank put a one in chat if you've heard the word <laughs> hank before yeah. uh <laughs> hank it's a, it's a very weird word i've never heard it anywhere but in magic hank the word hank a, a hank gaggle of, of geese a hank of rope a hank of rope it's actually a measurement yes yeah. it's know. a real measurement right it's like 100 feet or something. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. I think a 50 foot. There's Well, no, there's 50 foot Hanks and 25 foot Hanks as well. Ah, a I think Hank. a Hank is just what we call a bunch of rope. <laughs> look it up. Go look it up. All right, let's watch some more bears. I wish I had a Hank of hair. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hank of hair. <laughs> Forrester. Uh, let's continue on. Let's watch the next one. This is right. a, more of a, a classic mentalism piece. This will look similar to something that you've seen before if you've been... Uh, exposed to a lot of mentalism, but definitely has uh, various twists on it. So another great piece. How many of you ever read a book called Alive that came out in 1973? It's remarkable. You're not the guy on the left. And a new biography. This is a story of a uh, rugby team from um, Uruguay that was in a military flight and was shot down in the Andes in Chile, 11,500 feet, and they survived for 74 days. But they all didn't survive. So 22 lived after the crash, and when they collected them, there were 14 alive. And they had to eat each other. Now, how in the world were they ever found? 
in that first story, the woman said that she went to a, a woman who did psychometry. I didn't even know what that word meant. And psychometry is apparently that vibrations adhere to personal objects. And what this woman did in the story is she put a map down and held the boy's belt buckle, some personal possession, moved her finger over and said, here. And that plane was found within a few hundred yards, 74 days later, of the place that she said. No. I absolutely do, personally, do not believe in occult stuff like that. But for your entertainment tonight, this afternoon, I would like to do something which I call pseudo, which is false, psychometry. And I'm going to involve you, have you all involved in the demonstration. And to do this, we do this. I ask you to hold my big bag here. My big bag. In a second, I'm going to have you put your hand in your own pocket. Put your hand in your own pocket, if you would. So many good joke opportunities. <laughs> If this, if we were watching, what's his name? That boy, we would have already had ten of them, and it would be all ladies. Little shoe bags. Now, I ask you to be serious for a second. I want you to turn and face the wall. Be serious for a second. Face Scotty, the wall. Yeah. Place your hand in your own pocket. Remove a personal object. So it could be a comb. Turn, turn around and face the wall. It, it could, it, it, it could be uh, keys. It could be a wallet. It could be. Any, any per have you done that? Take that object now in your right hand. Have you done that, gentlemen? Say yes. Yes, yes. Put that object against your chest and say in your manly voice, this is my object. This is my object. Let's hear you. This is my object. This is my object. Another good joke opportunity. Now, let's, let, let's, let's assume you're all sopranos. Let's assume you're all sopranos. And in unison, let's hear you say, it in as sopranos, this is my object. Let's hear you right now. <laughs> All right, I want you to take your object and place it in the bag. Take your object, place it in the bag. And pull the string, but don't tie it. Pull the string. And my associate, who's, you're, you're, you're helping me? Who's helping me? Would you come? Turn and face me, please turn and face me. Turn and face me. Everyone just turn and face me. Turn and face me. And open your bag, please. Give her a round of applause for being assistant. This is going to be a good trick, you guys. Just hang in there. Hang in there. Any, any, uh, bag, any object, take it out. And we're going to do it together, but, but only women. The men can watch. The object which I hold in my hand I know this with a great deal of confidence. The object I hold in my hand belongs to a man. Nice. A real man. This object belongs to you, sir. Yes, you are. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, now there's nothing psychic. Did you see what he did? Women especially. Did you watch? As soon as he saw that, he, he went like that. And I just followed his body language. Let's try it again. Only women. I like that. That's cool. I do too. Great little subtlety there, huh? Mm -hmm. This time, I'm going to ask each gentleman to just say one word. No. No, no. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> oh, they're so wonderful. All right, no. I'm going to hold the object up, and they're going to say, I'm going to say, is this your object? They're going to say, no. One of them will be fibbing, just one, right? Are you with me? The others will be telling the truth. Women, just women. You know, where were you last night? Or just, so you were... <laughs> That's Bob. Is this your watch. object? No. Is this your object? No. Is this your object? No. Is this your no. object? <laughs> Women, just women. Are you ready? Are you ready, women? To use your intuition. This is your object. Yes. You can go back now. You're right. Always the gentleman. You're right. Fibbing. 
All right, well, up the game, women. This time I'm going to hold it uh, under their eyes. Just watch their eyes. You won't say a thing. Just watch their eyes. <laughs> I have never seen three sneakier men in my life. <laughs> Women, only women. Are you ready to declare? Are you ready yeah. to declare? Yeah. It's your object. <laughs> mm -hmm. The last one's going to be the hardest. Got the other one too. <laughs> <laughs> Give her a round of applause. Put this hand out. Shut your eyes. Come right here. Put, put this hand out. Face up. The other way around. Shut your eyes. Only by the sense of touch. Only by the sense of touch. Only by the sense of touch. This is your object. This is your object. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Yep. Good. Yep, yep, yep. I, I love the, uh, having the women on his side the entire time. You know, so he's always got those cheers with them because he's like saying, watch, I know that you know how this is going to turn out. And then, you know, and whether they agree with him or not, he gets the round of applause because it's the applause cue. And it looks like everyone's just with him the entire time. It's just interesting ploy. I think it's Steve, you're on mute. You're on mute, Steve. But I do have a question for Steve. Steve, no. is this the kind of is this the kind of routine you 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 might do? How, how do you I don't know? It? You know, the thing about it is it's just uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. It kind of, it kind of, uh, I'm not a mentalist per se. I'm a comedy magician. Right. And so it kind of jumps into that realm of, uh, like the Q and a does a little bit in my right. mind. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. Yeah. What but I was thinking this would be great. I mean, I don't think what we just saw really does justice to what that effect is for a couple of reasons. You know, one, not enough space. He's got all those guys crowded up there. I mean, if you had just enough space, where he could stand next to each person, right? Then that that's going to look a lot better. The whole thing's going to look a lot. Not that it didn't look good, but you'll be able to see what's happening more. You know? Yeah. Right. But um. Yeah, I mean, I I I like it. You know. I, well, plus, you know. like women, like in general, if a woman has her purse with her, she's going to have a lot more items to choose from right men i don't know i i don't carry i have two items in my pocket at all times like a wallet and a phone that's you know? it that's it yeah and keys maybe if i'm well, no because ev everything in my life everything in my life starts with a push button with the exception of one of my vehicles but you know what i'm saying um, my front door has buttons so it doesn't have i don't have keys in my life anymore thank you you have to carry the fob for the car right no no the car didn't even work off a of fob no, no, I hate, I just hide the fob up under the bumper. Hmm. Uh, anybody, anybody can steal which, it at any which time. Which bumper? No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I guess I shouldn't say things like you just that. Said that on, yeah, you internet, just said that on. Yeah, you said that out loud. <laughs> Millions of people watching. Wow. Um, Little do they know, it's a 1973 Pinto. They don't know. <laughs> With a key fob that had a start. With a key fob and a push button start, you know. <laughs> Push button. No, I'm not joking. My my wife's my wife's father had an old vehicle that that uh, that that that, that broke uh, broke a key off in the ignition, and oh. he's a helicopter mechanic, so he just rewired the whole car so that you <laughs> can start the car by flipping a switch and pushing a button. The same way you would, same way you would start a Black Hawk helicopter. Anyway, uh, so that, that the other thing about that routine, right, is that. I've never seen Bar Barry Richardson do that routine. That's the first time seeing it. And then something kind of st stuck out to me about it, which was he started the routine. Pre he prefaced it with this story about how live the movie uh, and about how that those people were found. And he talks about psychometry and how that, uh, you know, that, 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 that then, then he lets them turn around. They, they imbue their spirit into the object. But then he does a series of what I would call body language tests it, that mm. to me, it's like NLP after that. Right. 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 It yeah. is sort of a disconnect, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's just it, so and, and I'm not 
um, bagging on him at all. I think Barry Richardson's awesome. It's just to me, it's it's a uh, it feels like maybe something I might do, which is where I might only you- think a trick away uh, through a certain length and then get up and perform it, you know, and I never fix it because it works or whatever, but it's missing the continuity. It is. Do you yeah. know, do you know what I, I have done come to think of it on a few occasions? Uh, blackballed, I think, uh, Rafael oh, Benatar sure. had it right. And what I did there was I asked, I asked each person to take a ball. And then I say, I want you to tell me something that's true. Tell me something that's a lie. And then tell me, you do not have the black ball. Nice. Okay. Right. Nice. Yeah. And and so what ended up happening was when you tell them to tell a lie, some guys came up with, you know, some people came up with really funny things that you could play off of. I remember one guy last time I did it, he was like, I have 17 children with four different women, you know, right. It was like a religious conference, too, or something. So it was really, really funny. It was really right, right. funny, you know, right, right. Yeah. Well, that, and that's funny. Well, because that is your very much your style. Like, like mm-hmm. for anybody that doesn't know Steve's style, he he's always going to find the most engaging, funny way to like spin a routine so that uh, so that it involves everybody and plays really huge. Whereas you know, Alex, Alex is more like just a he's more like a mystery man. Like Alex is going to show mm-hmm. up at your party and you're going to be like, "There's this wizard here." <laughs> you know? so they have very very different approaches to magic and and they're going to see a different you know positives and negatives from from both of uh both of them are going to see it so that's why it's great having always having you guys on the panel because you have different viewpoints on things but for me also the other thing about that performance and tell me if if this bothers you at all is that the method is very plainly listed in the encyclopedia or at least it was when i was a kid so I've always felt like the method for it was really well known. When you looked up magic in an actual encyclopedia, there was about two or three uh, tricks that were the methods were listed for them. And that's uh, although it used envelopes, but that was one of the methods that was listed in the encyclopedia. So I kind of felt like the method for that trick was really, really well known. What do you think? If you read a lot of encyclopedias, you know, I, I think that I think you're giving the public more credit. And I think recent events have shown that people are not as much of readers as we might expect Mm -hmm. if you want to hide something right put it in a book that's it totally you know put it in a book you know the if if we're gonna you know poor barry's passed on now right and so we i never want to speak ill i think all the bags make it too much of a handling problem to make it very streamlined you know what i mean it's just a lot of bags and knots and they tied it this way. And there's just a lot of stuff there that make, that's not interesting. But you know I would I mean? play devil's advocate on this one and say, if we went for the ideal solution of performance that you were speaking of in terms of being on a stage, yeah, yeah. Out, those bags will probably go mostly unnoticed. If you yeah, have that what, space in the what, interaction, you know what I mean? Yeah. What I was getting at was the bags should be constructed differently. Right. Instead of the drawstrings, it could just be a Velcro flap, which would be mm. much easier to open yeah, and just get whatever's right. in out of there. And uh, and the bag should be stiffer. Mm. You know, they can still be cloth, but they should be like really starched and stiff, so they're not so floppy. So th- that's kind of what I was getting at more. It's just like when you have props like that, you have to be able to look at what you're doing and go, "This is what's hanging it up," and then you have to figure out something that fixes it. You know, and it doesn't have to always be something different. Sometimes it's just playing, using common sense. You know what I mean? Sometimes, is, I mean, sometimes it's changing the moment. Like it probably, if they just changed the idea of how the bags are collected, if that lady had a basket and everyone was dropping. Yes, and there's that, another thing, right. Probably would have cleaned all of that up. They sure. probably wouldn't have even said anything about it, right? Because it yeah. would just gone by. I just see a lot of dead, when I look at that routine, I just see a lot of dead time there. That's not okay. particularly entertaining. Yeah. And nothing's particularly happening. So it just, you need to clean that up. And that's in any routine. God, this is why you're one of the best, man. It oh, really is. Because you're Come so on. right about that. Like you, you were able to watch that one time through and, and you're, and you were able to f- just find w- great little examples of how two to three minutes could have been cut out and the whole thing could have been streamlined and made, I think just tighter, much, yeah, tighter. Yeah. You know? And maybe, you know, maybe, maybe we're talking about what 20, this is, this was filmed 25 plus years ago. Probably. Yeah. What was it, Alex? What, 
Well, it's probably more than that. It's probably, no, it's probably like 15, maybe 20 years okay. ago. Okay. I was going to suggest maybe people had, you know, pre-internet, people had a little more patience. Uh, now, you know, everything's so fast, 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 fast. Maybe we... No, I, even... think you, I think you hit it on the head earlier, Adam. When you said the thing about the movie reference and the, the story mm -hmm. reference of people being on the mountain and, you know, that was there, like a big major plot line that could have fed that entire routine and then he changed gears halfway through. Mm -hmm. I think it was just he didn't think it all the way through with all of these things that we're bringing up. He probably didn't have the benefit that we have. We're able to watch this, look at it, and analyze it. He probably never recorded himself and looked at it, you know? Well, that's that's exactly right. Probably never recorded and looked, at, looked at it himself. But I think I've said this before. That's the most important thing you have to have is because when you're a magician, right, you're the producer, the writer, the director, the technician, the performer, the customer service, you're like everything. That's and right. one of the things that people don't do is be the director, right? Is to stand back, remove yourself from it and just watch it with a clean eye as if you were an audience member. What do I see? And it's right. very difficult to do that. And I've directed plays and stuff like that. And so I have that eye, you know, I kind of look at it that way. You know, right. like what is the audience really seeing? Like, what is the thing, you know? You know, it reminds me of our member mastermind show. It's the opportunity for the members yeah. to come in and perform magic. We get to give little directorial tips here and there and sort of train the members to have that eye themselves so that they're mm -hmm. looking, discerning, you know, and just looking with that discerning eye and trying to make sure they're ironing out all the wrinkles, you know, so it's as smooth as it can be. It's, it's, it, you're totally right, man. It's the truth. I think member mastermind is the best thing we do. And we do a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I really think it's the best. It's pretty wonderful. Well, why don't we wrap it up and watch this last clip? And then, uh, and that'll be the end of Barry Richardson for Afternoon Astonishments. And we'll move on with another artist for next time. But let's watch this last clip. Let's have a look here. How many ever saw the movie? I don't remember the name of the movie where a man goes down to the subway station and he hesitates for a second, and he misses going through the door. The door changed, closes. And then they do the movie again, and this time he gets through the door. And, and, and how his life would have changed, the woman would he sat next to, what would have happened if, if he would have made that choice to plunge ahead versus where he was. And look how we have choices, and we know that choices have consequences. For our fun, let, let's do a little demonstration. And I'm going to ask um, if you'd come and help me, please. A little round of applause. <laughs> you're going to be my uh, assistant, associate, and you're going to be a courier. Okay. And we're going to point to um, men in the audience. So I want you to just point to one. Which one? Right there. This, this gentleman? Yes. Three envelopes. Choices have consequences. You can have, you can have your choice. Okay. One, two, or three. I take the middle one. Two. Two. Will you hand him the envelope? Okay. Thank you. We have two envelopes. We point to another gentleman. Uh, right there. This one or this one? Three. This, this, this one. Yeah. Now this gets interesting. You two can change. If you're willing, if there's mutual cooperation and willingness, you can change. No, I don't. You can change with Barry Richardson. Do you want to change? No. You, you can change. You want to change. Oh. OK. <laughs> Okay. Do you want to change again? You want to change with him? No. You do, but he doesn't want to change with you. <laughs> All right. Now, if you hold your envelope up on, by, the, by the envelope area, you see there's a little tear in there. So oh, to make it easier for you to tear, do you see that? Tear that off a little bit. Tear, tear the top off. Go ahead and tear it off? Yeah, but now put, put the piece in your pocket because we're environmentalists. I want to keep it clean. <laughs> and you look where we live here. You know, we want to keep it beautiful. All right. I would like you to uh, 
put your finger in and take out the, there's a little card, take out the card. What does the card say? Adequate for professionals. No, on the other side. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so much for prof professional etiquette. Um, congratulations, you made a good choice, Barry Richardson. And what have you got in your envelope? A bunch of money. Take it out. <laughs> a buck. Very, very. <laughs> have, you always, have you always been that intuitive? Have you always been that good at it? Very, very good. Oh, you open your, take out your little card. Hey, good choice. Congratulations. Good choice. Barry Richardson. What, what'd you get? <laughs> Chipped. Chipped? <laughs> what? 25 cents. Well, you know, in life, sometimes people get what they deserve. <laughs> Would you pull the... Um, the, the there's something in that. Not the, okay. Yeah, what's in there? That little green thing. Pull out the green stuff. No, the, that, little, that, the, the green thing first. <coughs> oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. A bill? No, it's a $100 bill. Oh, my gosh. It's $200. <laughs> you are so greedy. OK, now. What, what, what does it say in the little note? Okay. You are a kind and generous person. Now give this money to your wife. Remember, choices have consequences. Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you. He's so nice. He's so nice. Yeah, always the gentleman, you know? Bank night. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I love this a lot. Gifts. I love that he gives gifts to the other people and they, they walk away with something. And it doesn't point right to the fact that he's going to have that money. It's pretty mm -hmm. good. It's a nice little bit of smoke in there. You know, bank night's a great effect. It's tricky if you don't rework it, you know, yeah. because in an original bank night effect, the, the, you know, the people who get the envelopes, I can't come up with spectator right now. They're, they lose by design. Right, because the object is you're gonna they're gonna get nothing and you're gonna have something. Right, right. That's the whole point of the thing. Yeah. And uh, I mess with it so many different ways. Like Carol Fox had some great stuff that I used to do where he'd put a joke in every envelope. So when the person reads it, it's a joke. Right. That's you know? That's and, and so that was great. And so then I used to have the last person have a bunch of lottery tickets in it. Mm. Right. And then her job was to go to the other people and give them each a lottery ticket, like a scratch off. Really right. Good. So I went, bought some dollar scratch offs. Okay. So I did it one time, you know, and I had the hundred, but you all get lottery tickets. A guy scratches it and wins 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. It was, it was awesome. You know, <laughs> I didn't even feel bad because right. the, the, here's what happened. He won 500 bucks. And then everyone's like, no, really? No, this is a trick. Is that real? Did that really, you know, they don't believe wow. it. Wow, that's it, really cool, I man. just bought three lottery tickets, you know. And you probably bought yourself another show. That's really great. Oh, I mean, it was a great, it was just really great. That's great moment. Good, man, what a good tip. Hey, anybody out there that wants to do this trick, that's a good way to do it. Gosh. You got to take the sting out of it. That's right. It still doesn't take the sting out of it, but if everyone gets a laugh, you know, they have a moment, they read something, it's funny, you have some interaction. Oh, I'm sorry you didn't get the money, but here's a lottery ticket for you. The lottery you know, ticket is good, man. That's gold. Yeah. I yeah, I just put it out in the world now. Everyone will be doing it. That's right. Nice With work. A massive viewership. That. <laughs> That's how it works here. We, yeah. we put it out in the world. Put it out, man. And we see what happens. All right. Well, you know, uh, I have to say, I always enjoy watching Barry Richardson. If you've never got his book, you should. Theater of the Mind, right? That's mm. the name of it? Yep. Theater of the Mind, there's Act Two, and then Encore Performance, and then there's a couple of sets of notes, and all of them have outstanding material. But I don't think that there's a bad a bad batch book in that whole batch. You're going to be happy with any of the Barry Richardson stuff that you get. Mm -hmm. And some of the standalone tricks, like we watched Quartet in the last one, that's a standalone effect with notes and a, a special thing that you need to make everything. Outstanding. 
outstanding. All of his stuff is outstanding. So you won't be sorry if you're into mentalism because, you know, make no mistake, it is mind reading like material, you know, but yeah. Barry, you know, he has masterful uh, methods and routines. It's really, really, really wonderful. And if you, you know, if you do like what you saw today, go and find his other stuff because they are a little bit longer, but you'll see some of these things in action. And that's, that's fun. It's fun to just see it. You know? Hey, Alex, are Barry's uh, books in the store? No, they're out of print, sadly. Are they, they are they are totally candidates for being reprinted. And we might, you know, they might come out again and we'll point it out in the club when they do come out again, because if they do come out again, make sure you get on the train and get a set of these because like I said, they're just outstanding. Um, but now they command very high prices. Like you can yeah. easily pay like a couple hundred bucks for each of those books, you know. Always happens. Yeah, yeah. When they're out of print. Goes. All right, thank you for joining us. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, we see you fiddling Johnny and uh, the rest of you guys watching on YouTube. And uh, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. If you're here with us live, if you're a member and you're here with us live, stick around. We're gonna do a little bit of an after show segment. And if you've never thought about joining the Magic Club, you should think about joining Conjure Community Club. We are the world's best Magic Club. We have a lot of fun. These are fun. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, do us a quick favor. Hit uh, follow or subscribe or both uh, on this video here, and you'll be notified when we go live next time, which should be in only in a couple of days. All right, guys. Thanks for a great day of watching Magic. We'll see you next time on Conjure Community Live.